everyone. So today we're going to start our discussion of the application of specific strategies that we've been learning about over the last several lectures to specific disorders. And this is where the empirically based treatment part of it comes in. Because what people often do is they take the CBT strategies and then they kind of put them together in a manualized type of fashion to address specific disorders. And we'll be going through some of those today and those are what you're going to be reading about in your Barlow textbook. The first um, topic that we're going to be talking about generally is anxiety disorders, and there are many disorders under this kind of umbrella. umbrella. Um, but I wanted to touch on anxiety disorders first and foremost because this is often what you're going to come across when working with various patient populations, as these disorders are very highly prevalent in the population. I think we can all relate to anxiety disorders because we all have symptoms of, a of anxiety to some degree or another. While we might not have full-blown OCD, we do have certain things we obsess about and certain compulsions that we have. It doesn't necessarily meet diagnostic criteria. While we might not have GAD, we all have things that we worry about excessively. While we may not have social phobia, we do have situations in which we feel uncomfortable. And we all definitely probably have some sort of fears. Um, you know, it may not be to the extent that it's a specific phobia, but we do across the board um, see that uh, many of people experience these types of things. So here are the specific breakdowns for lifetime prevalences and 12-month prevalences for men and women. Um, but then when you look across the board, about one quarter of the population um, will have experienced some sort of lifetime anxiety disorder, and this is meeting DSM criteria. Um, the anxiety disorders are more prevalent among females than males. And that could be a reporting bias, or it could be um, that the, the artif it's generally um, some sort of uh, you know, relationship between hormones or some gender-specific issue related to anxiety. So the first thing, uh, anxiety disorder we're going to talk about is social phobia. So it typically has an early onset with about age 14 for girls and 16 for boys. And once it develops, it kind of has a chronic and unremitting course in pe until people seek treatment. And this is not just like, I do not like public speaking, which very few of us actually do, um, but this is to the point where it's interfering in your daily life. So you have to think of the DSM criteria for interference in daily functioning. This doesn't mean um, that somebody who does not have the interference or that it's not you know, a significant problem in their daily lives cannot seek treatment for these issues. You know, I definitely myself have benefited from different strategies in coping with feelings of, you know, stress and anxiety. I think we all can. Um, so, you know, just for someone to seek treatment doesn't necessarily mean they have to have the diagnosis. But these treatments are designed for people who have symptoms as severe as meeting um, diagnostic criteria. So some typical thoughts that you'll hear from people who have social anxiety disorder are, what I said sounds stupid, I'm boring, I'm gonna make a fool of myself, they don't like me, they'll see I'm anxious, I won't have anything to say, and I'll blush, tremble, shake, sweat, lose control. Um, these are all things that we say to what ourselves, but to, for people with social anxiety disorder, these become more severe and they become debilitating and they prevent them from engaging in, in many types of social interactions. So in order to have social phobia, as I mentioned, you have to have a significant interference in work and social functioning. It, and in some cases, it results in an inability to work, attend school, socialize, um, and marry are some of the kind of things that we're seeing in clinical samples. So, you know, you may see kids who, you know, can't get their degree because they have to take a public speaking course in order to get their degree and they can't do it. And therefore, they never, they never graduate. Um, most common co-occurring anxiety disorders uh, or social anxiety um, are among alcoholics and undergoing, undergoing detox because if you look, you know, we talk about maybe substance abuse masking some of the underlying problems and a lot of people drink in social situations to make themselves more relaxed and so many times that then becomes more generalized and people develop substance abuse problems. So typical feared situations for people with social anxiety disorder are public spe speaking, Parting, parties, pardon me, I can't speak today, meetings, authority figures, eating or drinking in public, working or writing while being observed, or making telephone calls. Um, you know, I personally can say that I used to be horrified of public speaking. It's still not my ultimate favorite thing to do, but I'm much more comfortable, especially when it's not a huge auditorium. It's huge auditoriums still make me nervous. Um, I have never been a great party person. Um, does that mean I don't have social pho does that mean I have social phobia? No, um, but it means that I can definitely benefit from some of these strategies that we're going to be talking about. 
So the primary primary um, treatments for social phobia are uh, cognitive behavioral group therapy, exposure, and cognitive therapy. So let's talk about CBGT first. Um, the potential advantages of group treatment are that you learn vicariously by looking at the experiences of the other people in your class. It also helps you feel some feelings of comfort for people, you know, hearing that other people have similar problems because oftentimes when people have problems, they feel they're very much alone in the world. And when there are other people sharing their feelings and thoughts and they have similar ones to you, it makes you feel better. Um, it also fosters independence in the sense that, you know, you can practice in a safer environment. Um, you can learn through helping other people. A lot of people feel better that way. There's a public commitment, so when you say you're going to go do something, you now have the responsibility of coming back to the group and telling them how successful or unsuccessful it was, which is motivating in and of itself. I know, you know, one of the things that they say with weight loss is that one of the, um, or committing to an exercise regime, for example, is to do it publicly on Facebook because then people want to know and you feel some accountability whether there is that, that or not. And you also see encouragement through other people's successes. So even if you're struggling, seeing other people succeeding kind of can help you recognize that there's a possibility for you as well. So in terms of the procedural components, there's an educational component, which in many uh, CBT-based groups, there's kind of a psychoeducation component where you explain, you know, the, the theory behind social anxiety disorder and the different, and the treatment and how the treatment is going to work. You then ex um, create exposure simulations by creating a hierarchy, so each individual will create their own hierarchy, which is your blog number four exercise to do. You then do uh, cognitive restructuring around some of the beliefs that we talked about earlier, so some of these things like what I say sounds stupid, I'm boring, I'm going to make a fool of myself, so you'll work on cognitive restructuring around those things. And then there'll be a lot of home-based practice skills because um, social phobia is often construed as a skills deficit, but you're going to be doing self-monitoring of your anxiety as well as your thought processes, cognitive restructuring, as well as in vivo exposure. So here you're really combining the cognitive and the behavioral aspects in the, in the treatment. The systematic desensitization can be imaginal, whereby you're only imagining these situations. Um, for people who have tremendous fear, so if it's, if it's very difficult for you, you might start with it, you know, um, doing it through imagery. However, in order for it to be effective, especially with social phobia, you have to have a real um, situation. And in some of these groups, they actually conduct, um, you know, they'll actually hire confederates or have graduate students or undergraduate students participate as an audience and sometimes they'll have them, you know, pretend to be boring or pretend to be bored, sorry, so that, you know, it helps people face their worst fear and, and be able to handle it. And oftentimes it's a combination of both imaginal and in vivo, so you'll start out with imagining the situation and then you'll move to in vivo situations. You're going to use your SUDS rankings to, ratings to establish a hierarchy. And you usually have about 10 to 15 items on your hierarchy. So I usually use a 1 to 10 scale, with 10 being kind of a suds of 100, 1 being a suds of 10. And then you work up by kind of 20, 10 point increments. Um, depending on you know the degree of anxiety the person is experiencing, the, the hierarchy can be a little bit larger with smaller increments. And it's not to say that once your hierarchy is written, it's set in stone. This can be very much a malleable process, and you can change it as you go through. Um, and sometimes when, when, a, when a client kind of exposes themselves to one thing, um, they'll automatically go and do the next one, or they'll, you know, by accident, let's say, expose themselves to something higher on the hierarchy, or they'll feel very brave one day and do so, and therefore it's not necessary to go to the lower levels, and so you might want to then increase the, the complexity and, and have some more higher le a level um, things on the hierarchy. So here's a sample hierarchy for social phobia. So 98, be the best friend of my, best man at my brother's wedding. Two is go to work. Christmas party for one hour without drinking, three, invite friends over for dinner, go for a job interview, five, ask neighbor to turn down the volume on the stereo, six, ask a question in class, seven, eat lunch with a classmate, eight, talk to a stranger on a bus, nine, talk to a friend on the telephone for 10 minutes, and 10, return an item of clothing to a department store. So you see that this person has various rankings on their said scales. Um, and then they would then proceed starting at the lowest rung at 10, in doing that activity, you would problem solve it, you'd work through it, you'd role play it if necessary, the person would go out and do it, they'd bring feedback back, and then you would go through the, the stages. Usually in developing a hierarchy, I usually start with number one and number ten first. 
I then do number five and then fill in the blanks in between. Um, just to give you another example of a hierarchy, here's one for a simple phobia like a spider phobia. So on the bottom rung is stand 10 feet from the spider cage. On the top rung, let the spider walk over your bare hand. I have to say that's not my favorite thing in the world to even imagine. Um, and here you might even start out with um, imaginal situations if the fear is too great for the person. You might even start out with something like a stuffed animal or a fake spider like a plastic spider and then move to a real spider. And then you kind of move through things on the hierarchy um, slowly. This could probably be done in one to two sessions with a simple phobia. Flooding is where a person is exposed for prolonged periods of time to fear-evoking but harmless stimuli until the fear is extinguished or the SUD scores significantly decrease. So this would be like, um, you know, if um, somebody has a fear of spiders to, you know, that there's that show, that fear factor show where they kind of had people, you know, like immersed in different things. So you'd stick them in a, a, a cage with multiple spiders and they would just have to stay there they would be terrorized for, you know, a good 20 minutes, but eventually, you know, as the spiders were creeping all over them, their sense levels would decrease and therefore their fear would probably be extinguished. And so oftentimes by exposing somebody all at once to their most feared stimuli and having them stay there and not avoid the stimuli, so they have to keep their eyes open, they don't even have to describe the spiders, the feelings eventually, um, that phobia will become will be overcome very very quickly so you know there's something to be said for just jumping right into the pool rather than waiting in very slowly because both are painful but one you get over with very quickly and the other one can can take forever my husband is a, a pool waiter he takes him like 15 minutes to get into the pool whereas I on the other hand will just jump in you have to also look at your clients personality and their ability to tolerate distress when, when doing these kinds of things so examples of common exposure, exposure situations that you might use in social phobia are initiating conversations, asking for a date, public speaking, writing in front of others, eating or drinking in front of others, working or playing while being observed. Um, there's a typo there. Um, now the problem with these situations is that in many cases you can control the situation. However, when you have people you know, doing these things, you can't know how other people are going to react. So you have to prepare your client that if they do a public speaking scenario, you know, their worst fear might be coming true. Like you know, they might urinate themselves, they might have a panic attack, their audience might react in a very bored way or be hostile to them, or the person might you know, um, um, then have uh, something that you know, they might react negatively or say no to them. So, sorry, I got interrupted there, but, you know, for example, if you ask somebody out on a date, you have to be prepared that the response could be no, or if you initiate a conversation, it could be that the person is not interested in talking to you and turns away. So you also have to prepare your client for those types of situations. Um, so some of the stuff that you may, you know, simulate with role plays in group or in individual uh, uh, therapy are assertion, interaction with authority figures, so asking your boss for a raise, um, you know, talking to somebody about some unjust treatment that you've received, going for a job interview, joining an ongoing conversation, which is always challenging, I think, for anybody, making mistakes in front of other people, expressing your opinion, and revealing personal information. So depending on, you know, what your issues are, there may be varying degrees to which these things bother you, and then you would treat them accordingly. One way to do this is through virtual reality, where you actually have simulations, um, of people and they can react in different ways and you're giving a speech um, and another way as I said is that you, people have confederates and that they actually have you know a live audience and you practice giving a speech in front of those people um, and you could also have them act differently um, the author of your textbook David Barlow has a tra facility in um, in Boston where they do a lot of anxiety related treatments and they are kind of the state of the art when it comes to virtual reality. Not all clinics are equipped to do this but they do a lot of work and they do a lot of work with the Boston VA in terms of PTSD work which we'll talk about later. So you can see here, I mean this is a very archaic um, you know, uh, virtual reality simulation. Now they can do things that are much more sophisticated but you can have an audience that has negative behaviors and how you feel about those, and then they can have more attentive, positive behaviors. So you also then want to try to integrate cognitive restructuring into the exposure activities, and so you can have them give their SEDS ratings at one-minute intervals. 
Um, and so when while they're giving their suds ratings, they can talk, they can you know say what their thoughts are, and then the rational responses to their thoughts. And so if you would have, you know, um, you know people behaving in a negative kind of way, like they are in this scenario, you can say people are behaving disinterested, they're very bored by what I'm saying, and you and then a rational response would be that you know they probably had a long day, they'd be bored with what anybody is saying. Or you might give a more realistic based response is that, you know, I'm not the most thrilling person, but at least they're still sitting in the room. Um, you can also do strict cognitive therapy for uh, social phobia, but that's described kind of in your textbook, and so you can kind of read that on your own. Um, but just to go over some of the, the core kind of assumptions and beliefs here is that, um, you know, people have excessively high standards for social performance. My speech must always be perfectly fluent. I must always appear, appear intelligent and witty. If I disagree with somebody, is a conditional belief they'll think I'm stupid. If I appear anxious, people will think badly of me. Um, so other core beliefs include if others want to know me, they'll let me know. And then I'm uninteresting, different, weird, I'm unlikable. Which obviously in many cases is not the case, but people have these beliefs anyway. You might use different assessment measures and we talked about the BDI, the BAI, and the BHS as common ones. If you're working specifically with people with social phobia, you might want to use measures such as a social phobia and anxiety inventory, a social behavior questionnaire, and a fear of negative evaluation questionnaire. Um, in terms of how cognitive therapy differs from CBGT, um, you kind of talk about the cognitive model, you talk about safety behaviors, You'll do video and audio feedback to the individual, so you'll record them and then give them feedback. You'll shift attention to observation of others. Um, you want to give them behavior experiments in a social setting. You deal with the anticipatory anxiety, um, which we all experience before we engage in some sort of you know, exposure exercise and, your, and how that impacts your self-image. Um, we want to construct a, a more realistic self-image and then deal with the remaining assumptions that we, we have of ourselves. And so I'm going to skip through some of these future slides. You can read about these in your textbook because this gets kind of long. Um, so just some of the things that you want to identify are the safety behaviors. Um, when you thought that the feared event was going to happen, did you do anything to try to prevent it or prevent others from noticing it? Is there anything that you do to ensure that you come across well? What do you avoid drawing attention to to yourself? Do you do anything to control these symptoms? Because sometimes by um, having these safety behaviors, we avoid um, you know, encountering the feared stimulus, and so we actually have to expose ourselves to those. Um, what happens to your attention when you're afraid of the feared event will happen? Do you become more self-conscious? Do you have difficulty following what other people are saying or doing? And do you become less aware of other people? And so because of these situations, you, your world becomes very closed in and you don't notice necessarily what's going on around you. And so as you focus your attention on yourself, what do you notice? Do you have an image of how you think you appear? Do you have an impression of how you are feeling or coming across? And when you try to conceal your symptoms, how do you feel or look to other people? So. I remember, you know, just an example of this would be, you know, as an adolescent, when you have a pimple, um, which we all do in adolescence, and you look in the mirror and that thing is like the most enormous thing that you've ever seen in the world, right? Like you're magnifying very much what might be a very small blemish. And so I remember thinking that everybody's going to be staring at this pimple on my face. It's a, you know, it's a, it's disgusting. Um, and so I would like walk around with, you know, my hair in my face. I would put crazy amounts of concealer on it, which probably made it look much worse than it actually did. I would not look people in the eyes because I was afraid. And so by trying to conceal my symptoms, I probably actually looked much worse to other people. Um, so then you want to try to give them um, experiments where they manipulate the focus of the attention onto something else. So it's two five-minute conversations. The first conversation, the social phobic is engaging in their safety behaviors, and the second conversation, they're not. And then they predict the extent of anxiety and how well they'll come across with and without safety behaviors. And this is then videotaped or audio taped, and then the, they watch it and you kind of criticize yourself. And then you, um, you, know, you rate these ratings, and so you want them to kind of drop some of these safety behaviors and shift their focus externally instead of internally. And so by using the video and audio feedback, you can see your true self and um, 
you want to work through it with them. And so when they're discounting the accuracy of their image, you know, if they're they're seeing themselves in a very different light than they actually are, that's when you work with them on, on addressing some of those cognitive distortions. So some of the meta-analyses that have been conducted looking at the effectiveness of some of these interventions, um, they divided 49 studies into five classes of treatment. One was exposure-based, two was cognitive therapy without exposure, three was cognitive therapy plus exposure, four was social skill screening, and five was a waitlist control. And the trend for cognitive therapy plus exposure to outperform the other treatments, which makes sense to me because you're exposing the person to the feared stimulus while at the same time doing cognitive restructuring. The length of treatment predicted outcome and dropouts, thus the, sh the periods that were shorter, the treatments that were shorter were better than the ones that were longer, and the effectiveness of treatment Hi, over mommy. the follow-up period. You're going to have to forgive me, the children are now awake, so there's a possibility that you'll be hearing some background noise as we proceed, but I will do my best. Now we're going to talk about OCD, or obsessive compulsive disorder. So there's a lifetime prevalence of 2.5% for OCD, and the disorder is slightly more common among women than men. Um, the age of onset usually ranges from early adolescence to young adulthood, with earlier onset in males than in females. So this points to something potentially biological that's going on, and if you've ever worked with patients with OCD, you'll see that there's something qualitatively different than some of the other anxiety disorders. Not to say that it can't be treated, but there's an element of it this irrational kind of um, belief uh, that seems to be qualitatively different in my clinical opinion. So um, we all have obsessions and compulsions, however um, people with OCD have recurrent obsessions or compulsions that are sufficiently severe because they cause marked distress in their lives. So generally the compulsions are taking up to two hours or two hours or more per day and the obsessions are preventing them from doing things that are very time consuming and they significantly interfere with the person's normal routine, occupational functioning, or usual ex social activities or relationships. So if you have to check the house you know, 50 times before you can leave in the morning and you're late for work by half an hour every day, that's significantly interfering with your work. Um, there are different types of sub subtypes of OCD. There's the contamination and the doubting are the most common followed by somatic, the need for symmetry, aggression, thinking you're going to hurt somebody, and sexual inclusion. Checking and washing are the most common compulsions, followed by counting, the need to confess, ordering, and hoarding. So there are different forms of obsessions. So there are thoughts, there are ideas that are experienced as unacceptable or unwanted, so the idea of stabbing my child. So for somebody who has psychotic disorders, they may have these ideas, but somebody who has OCD will have this idea and that idea is very distressing for them because it's very incongruent, incongruent with um, their view of themselves and they don't have, they have no de I desire to do that. Um, images, many people have mental uh, visualizations that it experiences troubling like one's elderly grandparents having sex, visualizing yourself having sex with your parents, um, you know, uh, sacrilegious things if, um, you know, these things tend to sometimes have religious connotations for people that grew up in very religious households. And then you have impulses, unwanted urges or notions to behave in inappropriate ways, like to yell obscenities, which is separate from something like Tourette syndrome, or to engage in kind of inappropriate behaviors. People might also have violence, the impulse to attack a helpless person, um, the image of the loved ones being dismembered, or impulse to reach for a police officer's gun police officer's gun, which is interesting because um, I think we all have that impulse to a certain degree. As I walk to Penn Station in the mornings, I sometimes I look at the guns of the police officers and I think to myself how easy it would be um, to just kind of reach and grab one and then the consequences of that behavior. It doesn't distress me because I know I wouldn't do it and it doesn't consume much more than the few seconds that I spend looking at them, but I think that some of these, a lot of these things are kind of on a normal continuum where many of us have these types of um, thoughts or beliefs and that it's the only way it becomes dysfunctional that it's diagnosed as an obsession. Um, sex, people like to st start other people's generals or thought what it's like to be homosexual. One of the um, students that I'm supervising now in the doctoral program, she is seeing a client who has um, a fear that other people are going to view him as homosexual and he's heterosexual but he's very 
absorbed with the thought that um, people think that he is homosexual and it very much dominates. So they're doing a lot of exposures related to, to kind of homosexuality. Um, blasphemy and sacrilege, so the image of Jesus with an erection on the cross, or the thought that God is dead. In terms of obsessions, um, their contamination ones are 55% concern, concerns of harming self or others, 50% sexual concerns, 32%, somatic concerns, 35%, and symmetry concerns, 37%. So you'll see that these total more than 100%, and many people have multiple obsessions. So what is not an obsession? Worries about real life issues like work. Um, if you're worried excessively, that can be generalized anxiety disorder, but it's not obsessive compulsive disorder. Depressive rumination, so people who are depressed tend to fixate on things, but that is only mood congruent. Um, repetitive um, um, sexual fantasies that are appealing, so people, some people just have a, a large sex drive and this is something they fantasize about frequently. Jealousy. Um, preoccupation with a new car, boyfriend, etc. We all have these obsessive moments when you know something new and exciting has happened to us, or cravings to gamble, steal, or drink alcohol because those are, while they may be similar to obsessions, those are related to the specific dis disorders. So, mental neutralizations versus obsessions are often confused for one another. Obsessions are um, intrusive, unwanted thoughts that invoke anxiety or distress, and mental ritualizations are deliberate mental acts that we do to neutralize or reduce anxiety or distress. So you'll find people that have these kinds of obsessions often develop these neutralizing routines where they'll have to count to a certain number, they'll have to do different things in order to reduce the anxiety or distress that's produced by the obsessive thought. Compulsions are overt or covert responses to intrusions. They're designed to counteract the obsession and to decrease the anxiety the latter produce. So it's like a sense of having no choice. It's very time consuming, excessive, and senseless. So many times, you know, the pure person cannot, you know, explain what they're doing or why they're doing it. You know, they recognize that the house is not on fire, but they still have to check the gas stove 50 times. They recognize that, you know, um, washing their hands, you know, for the 50th time is not necessarily going to remove the germs. And typical compulsions are checking, washing, repeating, counting, ordering, and silent praying. The Y box is the typical gold standard assessment outcome measure for OCD. Um, it has an obsessions and a compulsive scale, and they have different levels here. So it's similar to something like the BDI, but again designed for uh, individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder. So when you're doing an assessment of a client with OCD, you want to make sure that you um, look at the content of their obsessions, both external and internal cues, and the consequences of their external and internal cues. You also want to learn about their avoidance patterns, so how do they manage to avoid the distressing things, what are their rituals, because many times these things are covert, and so unless you expressly ask them about it, you're not going to find out about a lot of the rituals that they do, or they might not be explicitly obvious to you. And you want to look at the relationship between avoidance patterns and the fear cues. Um, learning theory for, for um, in our, uh, conceptualization of OCD is that the obsessions give rise to anxiety or distress, and the compulsions are designed to reduce um, the obsessional anxiety. The performance of the compulsions prevents the extinction of the obsessional anxiety because the obsessions are being neutralized. Um, Therefore, the compulsions are negatively enforced by the brief reduction of anxiety that they engender. So um, people have these thoughts, they become very distressing to them, and they then do this behavior. The behavior is then reinforced because the anxiety is decreased. So therefore, the theory is that making people expose themselves to their anxiety-provoking um, situation without engaging in the obsession will therefore reduce the anxiety and decrease the, um, the reinforcing um, value of the compulsive behavior. So the most common um, treatment for socially, uh, for OCD is exposure and response prevention. Um, you can also do cognitive therapy, although I would, my advice to you would be to do ERP first, unless it becomes very aversive to the client and there's some reason you can't do it. And people might have um, combined medications and ERP. Okay, that was Zachary. Zachary is now, um, watching super wide. So in terms of behavioral techniques, there's in vivo or situational exposure, which is gradual confrontation of situations that evoke the obsessional uh, thoughts. So this is where you're actually, you know, um, having situations like, for example, somebody who has a fear of stabbing somebody, you would put a knife in front of them. 
um, and have them kind of um, expose them to those fewer stimuli or somebody that had homosexual fantasies, you would expose them to um, images of homosexual videos or um, engaging in sexual relations or something like that. You also do imaginal exposure where their gradual confrontation of the unwanted thoughts via tapes that they have to listen to again and again or um, different exercises they can do with you in session. The response prevention part of it comes from refraining from engaging in the neutralizing mental rituals, the reassurance seeking or the thought control strategies. So somebody, for example, who is a washer, you would expose them to germs and like such as having them, you know, touch toilets, stick their hands in garbage cans. Um, and then you would prevent them from washing themselves and they would have to kind of sit with that anxiety. It's very traumatic, but as people kind of, you know, as you have to imagine, they're doing this on a hierarchy. So they're starting out with very lower levels, you know, or lower levels, not very low necessarily, but lower levels of anxiety and kind of culminating in these much more high level rituals. Um, ERP was a treatment of choice shortly after it was developed in the 1960s. Um, and as I mentioned, you want to establish a fear hierarchy beginning with relatively easy items and gradually getting more difficult. And then the, the theory behind it is that gradual exposure to tr triggers um, you know, and an habituation to the fear response will then neutralize some of these things and they no longer will produce anxiety. So what happens is um, when you, uh, you, you treat the anxiety provoking situation where like for example you're having them touch toilets, you very quickly see a peak of, of fear where they're kind of getting up to their hundred sense level. So you can imagine, you know, even for the thought of us sticking your hand in like a, pub, a public toilet like the one at Penn Station would cause a great deal of anxiety. But as you have them sit there, um, you know, repeating it over and over again, keeping the germs and like rubbing the germs all over their hands, their arms, etc., etc., um, you therefore the anxiety decreases to a level where it's tolerable and therefore and they're not allowed to engage in the rituals um, and so therefore the anxiety becomes habituated and that's kind of the theory behind a lot of these exposure exercises so initially you know um, the fear is peaked but then you have to sit with it long enough until the fear goes down so sometimes this might take a long time so when you're planning your sessions, you keep, sometimes you know when you're doing ERP or any kind of exposure, it may have to be longer um, than the traditional 45-minute session, so you have to plan for that accordingly. Um, especially with ERP, many times the therapist also has to do it too to demonstrate to the client that it's okay. Um, this can be can potentially gross. Um, I know my uh, student that I'm supervising, what she would do is ahead of time, she would actually wipe down the toilets. Um, so she, you know, wouldn't be quite as gross for her, but at the same time, um, you know, the client doesn't necessarily know that you did that, and their fear is more of the act of the feared um, germs rather than the actual germs anyway, so it doesn't matter so much. So you'll see here, this is four sessions of exposure therapy, and you can see um, that the time to get the SEDS level down um, you know, decreases and the SEDS levels decrease over time. So session one, they're very high, and by session four, these things don't necessarily cause so much anxiety anymore. So in terms of setting up a treatment plan, you want to generate a list of situations and thoughts that evoke anxiety and urges to neutralize, and then the patient rates each of these in their SEDS scale. And so collaboratively, you generate the uh, exposure hierarchy as we discussed before, um, and then you want to make sure that the situations are realistically safe but will um, evoke obsessional distress. So you don't want somebody who's afraid of, you know, jumping off of ledges. You wouldn't want to put them on the edge of like the Empire State Building, for example. That would not be safe. But you want to put them in situations where there's really not a huge amount of fear that something is going to happen. So. The next phase is the gathering information phase. So you obtain um, information on OCD symptoms, history of the problem, you define the disorder for them, you explain it to them, you give the rationale for treatment, and you give the overview of the treatment program, what they should be expecting, and then you teach them how to monitor their symptoms using the SUD scales, and you want to take a general medical history just to understand kind of uh, if there are any other things that you should be, like if there was a for example, I know an individual who had uh, a TBI and following the TBI developed a lot of these obsessive-like symptoms and so there was a much stronger biological basis for this and understanding that can help in the treatment as well. Um, 
You then want to do an inspection of the patient's self-monitoring to make sure they're monitoring appropriately, identifying you know appropriate situations and their responses to them. You want to get more information about the obsessions and compulsions. Um, and then together you're going to be generating the treatment plan, uh, how to select exposure situations, and then you want to develop a clear contract between the two of you to know what you can expect of one another. Um, and then you want to teach them how to monitor their symptoms using different um, scales or using the SUD scale and then give them a homework assignment. Um, and so the treatment phase can be done, um, it's usually done over a shorter period of time. So rather than once a week, you're meeting multiple times a week um, and for two hours. So you want to determine how you know, you're going to format this for your client and what works in their schedule. So you're going to explain to them what they should expect, how the exposures will be implemented, and then there are going to be homework assignments where they have to continue these exposures between um, meetings. Um, you want to talk about how they're going to comment during exposure se uh, sessions, um, and then doing response preventions in terms of the rules, how, they, how long they have to sit with it, and how they're going to return to normal behavior. Then you also want to discuss some things that, that might you know d occur during session, like they're going to want to do their, their responses and how you're going to have to prevent them and that they should plan with those kinds of things. So here's a sample hierarchy for somebody with a contamination fear with a washing compulsion. So at the bottom, drink soda from a can without wiping it, use pens from the office at a lobby at an office, bring it in and open the mail, touch the floor at home, the hands flat, touch the floor at the office, hands flat, touch sidewalk, hands flat. So the, this hands flat might be kind of um, silly to you, but oftentimes people who have OCD will try to touch things with the very tips of their fingers, and this way the germs are you know, theoretically getting all over their hands. Um, you want them to wash for 30 seconds with no tile at the door, take out the trash, then eat dinner without washing their hands, touch several children at daycare, then touch things at home because now the home is being contaminated as well, go to bed without showering, and sleep with shoes in bed. Um, so, you know, each person is going to have their own hierarchy, and this was the specific one for this individual. And here is a hierarchy for somebody who has doubting obsessions with a checking compulsion, so they're worried whether they, let's say, um, turn the stove off is their, their worst fear. So down at the bottom of the hierarchy, do not walk back to the car to check if it's locked. Stop looking at surrounding cars in the lot to make sure you didn't bump them. Do not reopen mail to be sent. Do not look in a mirror after leaving the house. Proofread email only once. Stop af asking for reassurance from others. Check the locks once before leaving the house. Check appliances once before leaving the house. Check locks once before bed. Check appliances once before bed. So again, this is you can see they're still checking because it's your normal behaviors, but they're not doing it in an obsessive kind of way. Here's a sample hierarchy for addressing exactness. So leave books askew on shelves, stack dishes incorrectly, leave clothing on the floor overnight, leave bed unmade, rearrange items on desk randomly, pull a gahar in the driveway crookedly, stretch right arm only, wear two slightly different socks, Come, compare only 10 strokes on one side, 20 on the other, read aloud without rereading, and shave unevenly. So, you know, even just reading some of these things make me anxious, and I really wouldn't consider myself having an order or symmetry thing, um, but we all have, you know, different elements of this, and again, this is where it's becoming problematic in somebody's life. Um, this is a, a, sm a slight variation, it's a sub-hierarchy for reading out loud. So if somebody has, um, you know, various issues with reading out loud, you might do a sub-hierarchy. So read aloud with, without rereading, varying in tone, um, in session, varying in tone alone, in session, um, you know, so th there's varying in tone, intentionality, um, so you can see how those would vary uh, across if you have different things that you have to break it down, so one thing might not be sufficient, that there are various aspects or elements of it, you have to break it down into various pieces and expose the individual to each of those pieces. Um, here is a sample hierarchy for aggressive thoughts. Hold child in lap, spouse nearby, spend time playing with child, spouse in the next room, imaginal exposure, slapping the child, spend time alone playing with child at home, play on sidewalk, near street with child, stand near window at a high floor with child, walk with child near the balcony at the mall, um, you imagine that you are stabbing the child to use a small knife near the child and use a large chopping knife with the child nearby while allowing thoughts of stabbing the child. So again, you know, you as a therapist have to make sure this is not a person who is psychotic and you would make sure that this was a safe situation. 
but people who have OCD in this way do not often engage in these behaviors. Um, here is one person who has idiosyncratic or superstitious thoughts, order a different sandwich at a lunch place, do bedtime routine out of order, use the wrong staircase, park in an unusual place, wear the, uh, your unlucky color, come in from a different door than you exit, don't call spouse on the way home, take an unlucky number of steps, and make intentional small mistakes in written work. So here's an example of an in vivo exposure for somebody who's a washer. So in session one, they'd walk with a therapist through the building, touching doorknobs, holding each for several minutes, um, and they would not wash afterwards. You'd repeat the above thing and add contact with sweat by having patient touch armpit and inside of shoe. Repeat the above but introduce having the patient touch a toilet seat. Repeat the above but introduce urine by having patient hold a paper towel dampened with his own urine. Um, repeat above but introduce fecal material by having patient hold toilet paper slightly soiled with their own fecal material. And then um, you have them repeat uh, daily exposures to the three most uh, fear-provoking stimulus activities and you have them repeated over and over again. So you can just see that this is not something that we normally do on a daily basis, but because this is so overwhelming for them, we have to have them exposed to their most feared situation and if they can handle that and their anxiety decreases, um, then it, it doesn't, you know, while OCD rarely goes away completely, it can be minimized to the point where that it's not interfering in their daily lives, and these thoughts, you know, using mindfulness can be minimized. So for a checker, uh, in vivo exposure might look like session one, turning the lights on and off once, turning the stove on and off once, closing the doors on, open and closing the doors once, and leaving the room immediately without checking. Um, session two, you do the same thing, but then you add flushing the toilet without looking in the bowl. Uh, session three, you introduce opening the gate to the basement and closing it, allowing the daughter to play near the gate. Session four, repeat but introduce carrying the daughter on the concrete floor. The fifth one is repeat above but introduce driving on a highway without retracting the route because many times um, checkers will feel like they ran somebody over and they have to go back and check. And so sessions 6 to 15 require daily exposures to the three most fear-provoking activities. And these may be, can be done um, on your own or they may have to be done with a therapist as well. So rules for response prevention. Patients are not permitted to use um, water on their body if they're washers. Bath powder and deodorants are not are permitted unless they reduce contamination concerns. So you have to assess that thoroughly because if they reduce contamination concerns, you're just then um, causing avoidance of the fear of stimuli. Shaving is done with electrical shaver. Supervised showers occur for three mi three days for ten minutes, so they can't overly wash. Rich realist ritualistic washing of certain areas of the body is prohibited. Family members must supervise adherence to the rules while the patient is at home, and violations are reported to the therapist. And the last few sessions, re response prevention requirements are relaxed to permit normal washing. So you obviously can't stop somebody from washing for the rest of their lives, and they have to return to a normal behavior. But it, you want to. To therapy is terminated when you feel like the anxiety um, is no longer at a level where it's impacting the individual's life and then you can clinically make the judgment that they can kind of um, return to daily functioning. Um, for a checker there is no realistic, no ritualistic checking is permitted. They can do one check which is considered to be normal. Um, you have a relative or friend who supervises this in the home and a therapist or supervisor um, is to stay with the patient until the urge to check diminishes. So you don't want them to eventually go and check. They have to stay until they no longer have the urge to do so. And violations of home practice are reported to the therapist and then they're worked through in session and then you know, subsequent sessions are overcome. So when you're conduct constructing imaginal exposure scenes, they should be about 45 minutes in duration. Um, they should be, they should uh, have approximately six scenes of gradually increasing anxiety, um, and they should include both external and internal stimuli, both cognitive and physiological responses to the fear of scenes. So you'll have the person, um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, uh, if somebody's afraid of getting cancer, so that they, you know, the cancer is moving throughout their body, it is permeating every level of their cell, they're feeling the pain, they feel the warmth of the cancer kind of goes through their body, and you have them sit with that. Approximately 80% of people who complete therapy report beneficial effects, 
and up to 70, uh, six years following treatment, approximately 70% of the people will maintain their gain. So this is pretty astronomical for something that previously did not respond very well to intervention. But it's not a panacea. Um, 18 studies of ERP were review, reviewed, and there's an 83% uh, response rate at post-treatment. Um, and uh, nine months following, 76% of people still maintain their gains, and the mean sim symptom reduction at post-treatment was 46%. So while very, very significant, these things are still present to a certain degree, and this kind of supports my hy hypothesis that there's, or the evidence that there's a biological basis to it, and that you know treatment can help you know people maintain a normal lifestyle, but at the same time, these are not these are going to be issues that the person is going to be struggling with, but they now have skills and tools to help them with. Um, there are some limitations of ERP. Um, there's a high treatment refusal and dropout rate. It's very hard to do this because these are people with you know, weird things and they're exposing themselves to it. Um, so it's difficult to do ERP in centers that do not specialize in OCD. So um, it's, you know, it, people have to have special training to, to deliver this type of treatment. Um, psychiatrists don't have a very strong um, support of ERP. And a benefit is, is defined as a 30% decline in YBOX symptoms, um, which people are still obviously experiencing symptoms, but it's a, it's a decline. And it's very hard for people that um, suffer from primary obsessions and don't have necessarily compulsions because their um, mayhems or neutralizations are mental, and it's hard to control things that are mentalized. I mean, it's very easy to, to physically stop somebody from doing something, but to say don't think about something is much, much harder. Um, cognitive therapy for OCD, uh, I've already lectured you enough on this. I'm going to kind of skip through these slides. I'll post up the PowerPoint for this, so if you're interested, you can go through on your own and look at um, cognitive therapy for OCD. In terms of medication treatment, um, medication is often prescribed to go along with um, ERP. You can use SSRIs, um, uh, as tricyclics, um, and clomipramine, and neuroleptics like Halperidol, um, which is an antipsychotic medication. Uh, generally, both medication and um, ERP are effective. Um, but some studies find advantages for ERP over medication. So C, CBT or ERP is the choice for milder OCD. Um, however, relapse rates are higher after withdrawal of medication than after cessation of ERP, as is the case with many of our other interventions because we're teaching people skills that they can maintain rather than having the medication be the treatment. So overall studies do not support the combination of ERP and medication outperform e um, either treatment alone. However, different people respond differently to interventions. And so some factors that may influence your decision to use um, medications with your therapy are the severity of the symptoms. If they're only having partial response to the ERP, you might have to include medications. If there's a low, high degree of comorbidity between other disorders, like a low, high degree of depression or other anxiety disorders, and if people are just unwilling to tolerate the distress of ERP, then they have to take medications to minimize their symptoms. So now we'll talk about generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD. Um, so wording has been experimentally demonstrated to prevent emotional processing and thus may maintain any disorder wherein such processing is important for therapeutic change. Um, so once uh, somebody has received successful treatment for OSA for GAD, there are huge declines in um, comorbid symptoms. So GAD is when a person is worried for six months or more about a variety of issues and that worry is you're spending more than 50% of the day, more than half the days of the week um, worrying about these things and these things are generally, they may be realistic but the worries seem to be out of proportion to the degree um, to which they are realistic. Many times when people say they're stressed out um, this could be, you know, symptomatic of GAD. However, GAD, the duration must be um, six months or longer. So people who have GAD, uh, have GAD or a lot of worry tend to um, find ambiguous situations threatening. Um, they have an ele elevated estimation of risk. They tend to generate negative scenarios in ambiguous situations. A nice example of this is something that I do. Um, again, we all have 
I, I think I'm telling you all about my, my own psychopathology, but we all have symptoms of all of these disorders. But I remember um, several years ago, I was expecting a friend and she didn't arrive on time and I couldn't reach her by phone. And immediately I had this scenario that she was in a car accident and I called the hospital, which was very much out of proportion to um, the situation in itself. And obviously later on I thought it was kind of a, a nutcase, but it was um, definitely something I was thinking about. I don't know why these slides are doing this right now, so forgive me. But the impact on JD on healthcare utilization, it's the most prevalent anxiety disorder found in primary care settings. GAD patients are twice as likely to seek treatment in primary care as opposed to psychiatric treatment because people um, tend not to see you know, being stressed out or worried as a psychiatric condition, but rather as a condition of daily living these days. Um, and then among patients classified high in medical care utilization, 40% meet lifetime history of GAD and 22% meet current GAD diagnosis. So people who you go to the doctor a lot who are seeking medical treatment, many of them do have these worries. And we know that in addition to the symptoms that the worry um, creates, worry creates a bunch of other symptoms and other disorders. And so you know people with GAD, in addition to having worry, might have a host of other physiological symptoms. So in terms of assessing worry, um, some of the questionnaires that you can use are the Penn State Worry Questionnaire, the Beck Anxiety Inventory, and the SED scale that we've already talked about. People with GAD, as I said, worry about a number of different things. Primarily, the majority of them worry about family, followed by money, work, and illness. Now, here's how we differentiate GAD worry from normal worry. Um, patients with GAD are worrying over 300 minutes per day, whereas the average person is worrying kind of more like an hour a day. So we all worry, that's normal. Um, so worrying about an hour a day, you know, interspersed is, is perfectly normal. But when you're spending, you know, five hours a day worrying, that is very disproportional. And you can see there's a huge difference between those with a diagnosis and those with not. Um, so there's been kind of a lag in the development of psychotherapy for GAD um, as compared to other anxiety disorders. And I think part of that is because the disorder is much more diffuse and it's also considered to be somewhat more normal. Like you, you commonly hear, oh, I'm feeling stressed out. Um, and so I think people have not viewed this as pathological as it probably is. Um, early treatment research on GAD focused on somatic anxious experience and used relaxation to provide um, a more generalizable coping response to stress and anxiety, and even current treatments will involve the use of relaxation. So in CBT for GAD, I love those acronyms, um, you're doing the self-monitoring, noticing situations um, that are causing the stress, anxiety, notice how often that you're doing it, notice what the thoughts that are going along with it. You then do cognitive restructuring, applied relaxation, which is your blog exercise number three, um, coping and desensitization, so you work with them on coping, and then worry exposure, where you actually have them expose themselves to the worry situation. So, currently, in terms of our research on GAD, as I said, um, we're, we're lagging behind, but CBT is associated with low dropout rates and reductions in medication taking. You know, Xanax is not an answer, and people who go off Xanax often have um, relapses very quickly. However, at best, only about 50% of patients achieve recovery status, although we can minimize symptoms in many of the other patients. So currently, it's still you know, one of our frontline interventions, and I would encourage you to use CBT techniques. Um, but again, it's not a panacea, and you should you know, let your patients kind of know this in a more hopeful and optimistic kind of way. So we know that both pharmacological therapies and CBT lead to marked improvement in GAD symptoms in the, in the short term. Um, but the effects of CBT are more durable than pharmacotherapy once treatment is, dis is discontinued. And CBT is associated with low dropout rates and reduction in medication taking, which to me seems beneficial. And we're going to finish off with PTSD. Um, you know, of all the anxiety disorders, PTSD is probably one of the most severe. Um, um, but with good treatment, the results are actually quite promising. Characteristics of PTSD include intense reliving of traumatic experiences, re-experiencing through intrusive thoughts, nightmares, flashbacks, psychological numbing and avoidance, symptoms of hyperarousal or physical dysregulation, and comorbid with all of these symptoms of PTSD are symptoms of anxiety and depression. 
So what we typically think of with um, when we say PTSD is we think of people who are victims of a sexual assault, generally a one-time assault, as well as people who are combat veterans. We're seeing a lot of PTSD in our veterans coming back you know, from wars. We saw it in Vietnam. We're seeing it now with the Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan wars. Um, and so we do have treatments that can be effective in, in coping with some of these symptoms. But people have PTSD reactions to a lot of other circumstances, and it becomes a little more challenging because, you know, people who have chronic, you know, abuse, there's not one particular situation, but rather, you know, a lifetime sometimes of, of abuse that it can contribute to it as well. Um, in 97% of patients, once they develop PTSD, it becomes chronic until it's treated. Um, until treatment is received, most people with PTSD suffer for about 8.7 years, which is a great amount of time. Um, about half of them are taking some sort of psychiatric medication when they come to treatment, usually um, mid to late 30s and 75% female. Men often don't seek treatment for PTSD. Again, I think gender stereotypes, they feel like you know, they should be able to handle it. But we know that this is something that's kind of beyond handling it. 65% um, of people who have PTSD have multiple traumatic experiences, such as six, sexual abuse, physical ex abuse, accidents, death um, of significant others, such as murder and war exposure. So when you're doing a CBT intervention, um, there are several things that you want to start out with, which are the same as many of the other ones. Assessing the patient's safety, so you want to assess for suicide risk because there's a higher degree of um, suicide among patients with PTSD. We're seeing this a lot this a lot on our military bases right now. There's a tremendous amount of suicide. I forgot the statistics exactly, but I want to, you know, I could be wrong. I want to say it's something like one person per day, but it was very mind-boggling when I heard about it, and it was very tragic, honestly. Um, you want to look at the patient's goals. You want to educate them about their disorder and about the treatment. You want to um, work with them on tolerating distress, um, mastery and pleasure exercises, because many people who come to you with PTSD also then have comorbid depression. You do some cognitive restructuring. Then you start with the exposure, first imaginal, and then in vivo where applicable, and then relapse prevention. Um, Edna Foa is really, out of the University of Pennsylvania, is really the pioneer um, in, in the area of uh, exposure therapy for PTSD. And then Patty Resnick, who was at the Boston VA, and I believe is now um, in, I want to say, South Carolina, I could be mistaken, but she has kind of um, also taken, done a lot of work with um, trauma and is working a lot with the Veterans Association. So the goal of imaginal live exposure is to modify dysfunctional beliefs. So what happens when people ex experience these intense traumas is we tend to avoid thinking about them because they're so emotionally painful that we can't cope. And as a consequence, we've not emotionally processed this trauma. And it becomes this kind of like, if you want to think about the id, it's like, you know, this this beast that's kind of rearing its ugly head and you get all these symptoms like the re-experiencing it, the dreams, the nightmares, the flashbacks because we try to push it down. And it's not until we actually deal with it and kind of let it come to the surface and cope with it and feel the emotions and process this that, um, you know, we're able to kind of move on. That doesn't mean it's going to be okay. Like it's not okay to, to watch your best friend's head blown off beside you. You know, you're not going to be ever okay after that. But it's not going to be something that's, you know, kind of, keeping you paralyzed and from moving forward with your life. Um, you want people to write out about what happened, about the trauma, and reread it so they become habituated to it. Talk about the meaning of the event, so what does that mean for them? Because for many people, this ruins their perception that the world is a safe place as a consequence, and this has really kind of shattered this belief for them. Um, you do exposures to distressing but safe situations. Um, and then you, you help interpret um, you know, some of the fears that these people have, like the boundaries between safety and danger, issues of trust, power, competence. So you have to make them feel like it's okay to live in the world again, even if they, the world might be a more dangerous place than they initially thought about. Um, some of the beliefs about trauma, useful things they learned from terrible events, um, you know, jaded, cynical beliefs. They want to talk about the boundaries between safety and danger. So you know, we want to estimate risk. So even if you may have been in a plane crash, the risk that that will happen again is very low. 
Um, that there are many things that are predictable and controllable, but many things are beyond our control, and we kind of have to live our lives accepting that and putting power and trust in other people sometimes. Um, in terms of self-concept, uh, not blaming yourself, and then the hindsight bias, um, you know, we tend to overestimate the probability that something will happen once we had outcome information, and so kind of um, adjusting, understanding that, kind of like if, if you think about the sexual abuse at Penn State, um, everybody, you know, after the fact came out, you said, like, you know, why didn't people know? Why didn't they identify this stuff? You know, if I would have seen that happening, I would have done something. And hindsight is twenty twenty, And so, but in the situation before you have the outcome information that he was molesting the children, a lot of these behaviors can be interpreted differently. So this is a description of an exposure-based treatment for rape um, described by FOA and her colleagues. So I'm going to ask you to recall the details of the assault. It's best for you to close your eyes so you won't be distracted. I'm going to ask you to recall these pain, painful memories as vividly as possible. We call this reliving. I don't want you to tell a story about the assault in the past tense. Rather, I'd like you to describe the assault in the present tense as if it was happening to you right now. I'd like you to close your eyes and tell me what happened during the assault in as much detail as you remember. This includes details about the surroundings, your activities, the perpetrator's activities, how you felt, including your physiological responses, like your heart beating faster, what your thoughts were during the assault. If you start to feel uncomfortable and you want to run away or avoid it by leaving the image, I will help you stay with it. So you can see how tremendously painful this would be for somebody who has worked there, you know, since the trauma to avoid thinking about it. This is very, very painful, and so it's very difficult. And it takes a very skilled treatment provider to do it. And again, these are sessions that don't necessarily last only 50 minutes. They might, you know, last several hours at a time, and you have to be prepared for that when you, when you book the session. Um, now, again, with technology, and um, we can do virtual exposures, so you can kind of program in the same scenario. They're doing this a lot at the VA, as you can see, in combat situations. And so we use virtual reality to re-experience the combat trauma. It's multi-sensory um, in that, you know, there's auditory, visual, sometimes you can even do smell. Um, it uses Xbox technology, and it's found to significantly reduce PTSD symptoms. So there's a lot of promising stuff out there available with technology. Um, so the effectiveness of rape trauma treatment, this is FOA's work. Um, in nine bi-weekly 90-minute sessions, they resulted in increased organization of rape memory, increased narrative length and detail of memory, increased emotions and thoughts about rape, reduction in trauma-related symptoms, and reduction in depression correlated with meaning-making. So we're seeing, you know, the patients can actually remember details of the event now, but that overall they're able to handle it better and their symptoms of depression um, and, and PTSD.